Welcome to the North End Clinic. I'm Lisa Murray. I am the, uh, the chair of the clinic. We want to welcome Lee Bishop to do our clinic. I wanted to call this uh, Any Idiot Can Get Published, but I think Greg didn't like that idea, so I didn't want to call it that. Really want to go into just basic concepts of model train photography because it's really not that difficult. If you, if you have a grip on what you're doing, it's, it's Any Idiot Can Get Published. So this gives you an idea about looking for a specific location. Now, this area, that's actually an area that's about 14 to 16 inches wide. To the left is a bookcase. To the right is the open space for the where the aisle ends. I have a tiny little layout. So I'm always looking for new places to take pictures. Believe it or not, even on a small layout, you can find new spots. One day, I just happened to be standing at the end of the, where the aisle makes a right-hand turn, and I, and I just happened to look down there, and I thought, you know, I could make a good vertical shot. What I used as a prop here is a cardboard cone covered in cotton balls, spray-painted black. Now, I used a SLR camera, a regular camera mounted on a tripod, long exposure. Long exposures are your friends. They can resolve all kinds of depth of field issues. And just in case you're wondering, none of these pictures was used with any uh, photo stacking or focus stacking software. Any kind of manipulations was done only to change color, balance, shadow, things of that nature. I didn't add or subtract anything. And all these photographs is exactly what you see. I used a lot of old school techniques. So the smoke here was the cone held over the train. It's about a two minute exposure. So that's probably about 45 seconds to about a minute. And you can see translucent and actually see things through it like real smoke. So it's, it's a really simple old school technique I used to use with 35 millimeter cameras back in the day. And then when I went to digital several years, I was out of the hobby for a really long time. But when I got back in, I started picking up where I left off. And it's, it's cheap, it's easy, it's simple to do. You just got to play with it. But this gives you an idea of what you can do in a really small, tight area uh, on the layout. And that's the exact same angle. I dropped the, the tripod down. The editors of O-Scale Trains wanted a good vertical shot. I gave them two, but this was the one I was really hoping it was going to use for the cover. That's the exact same picture as the one before. I just lowered uh, the tripod down quite a bit. Now, you even got a, on the left-hand side of the shot, uh, there's actually a tree in the foreground. That's actually accidental. I didn't even notice that until the shot came out. That's the exact same angle. I use the smoke cone for a little less, so the, it looks like the, the steam engine is being fired correctly. There's not nearly as much smoke in it. Matter of fact, you can almost, almost have a trouble seeing the smoke because of the masthead. If the masthead wasn't there, it would be a lot more obvious. But again, this is about a, a minute and a half to a two-minute exposure. The depth of field is not perfect. Structure in the background, of course, is a little out of focus, but I think it, I think it worked, and uh, they were really happy to have it. But again, it's, it's a simple shot, really long exposures. You just want to think about where this is because the layout ends about an inch off to the left. The bench work ends about, about an inch and a half off to the right. A lot of people would take a look at that area and think they would, it would never even cross their minds to try to get a shot of that. I'm going to show you how these things are done. You can take really good shots with a cell phone if you have a, a better one. Uh, some of these better cell cameras, actually, uh, some of them are even better than an SLR camera these days. But this shows you what I have in mind. So that's actually a standard tripod with a head designed for uh, cell phones. You can see what it's, taken, uh, what it, what it's zoomed in on. Uh, just a simple shot. It shows you what a good cell phone can do. And I didn't manipulate this in any way. I don't even think I messed around with the color balance or shadow or, or, or anything. Again, you don't have to have fancy equipment. The one thing I learned in art school was you, you don't have to have the expensive pencils. And I found out that uh, when you're taking pictures, you don't have to have the expensive cameras. You just got to have an eye for what you're doing. And you just got to take a oodles and oodles of pictures. Just play around with it. Look at a scene, get an idea of what you want. Take a whole bunch of shots, find out what works, what doesn't work, and you can build on that. All right, here's another idea, one that people normally, I don't see people doing very often. I like taking shots from inside the layout, and this gives you an idea roughly how deep the layout is. It's not very big. It's shaped like a, kind of like a letter R. So the widest part of the layout is about two feet, which is about what you're looking at right here. Instead of getting a shot from the side, look at an oblique angle like most people would do in this particular situation, you just place the camera on the tracks and actually uh, stare it down, and, and that way you're in the layout instead of taking it 
from the edge of the layout looking in. That was the same deal with this. I, I you have to play around with that, get the camera angle because normally a camera doesn't want to sit exactly straight on the on the tracks. I have like I think I have like a miniature hay bale holding the front of the lens up, and I think I had like a piece of wood or something on the far side of the camera trying to get it level. So there it is. So now I don't have a shot from from the edge of the layout looking in, I got a layout from the inside of the layout itself. So you're you're almost looking at it as if somebody was maybe standing on a barrel or something in, in O scale looking at things. Like all good photography, you you really want to get a good grip on what you're shooting, get a feel for the scene. Just because it's in the layout doesn't mean there's anything to look at. So I framed it trying to get some figures on the right, get the angle of the locomotive just right to where I can see the, uh, the engineer leaning out one side. Basically, you want to be prolific. You want to just take a bunch of shots. And in this day of digital cameras, it's actually really easy to do. It doesn't cost anything other than your time. So that didn't take very long to set this up. Well, it's a shot I've taken before, but it gives you an idea. I mean, just literally just put the camera down there. Use a cable release on your camera if you're shooting with an SLR or any kind of digital camera like that. You don't want to jar the camera at all. And again, you want to take as long of exposure as possible. Because if I took that as a standard shot, just a regular, just click, the number plate and the headlight would probably be in focus, maybe with the front coupler, and that'd be it. Everything else would be grossly out of focus. This isn't perfect. Some people would use a, a photo stacking software to make everything in the background. But with an SLR, you can't really pick specific areas to zoom in on. If you did that, your photographs won't line up. So that's more geared towards your cell phones. Drop your camera inside the layout. You'd be surprised at what you can get out of that. Right, and this shows you, you don't have to have expensive uh, uh, stuff for it either. To hold the cell phone in place to try to get a decent shot, I actually wedged two die cast uh, a GMC two and a half ton truck models up against it just to hold the camera in place. Some people will buy really expensive tripods and all kinds of devices for things like that. Well, that's fine. If you want to buy that stuff, there's no problem with it. and They work great. But in the end, it doesn't really matter how you got there. If you get the shot that you're looking for, who cares how you did it? So the next slide will show you what that one looked like. Okay, remember I said earlier, the earlier shot, the one that made the cover, how tight that particular area is. The last shot in this one gives you an idea. See the bookcase right there in the background. Obviously, this is not a shot that I'd want to get published or anything like that. I mean, that, that wouldn't work. If I was trying to use this for some kind of magazine or, 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 or something like that, I'd put a piece of uh, like blue material in the background to, to block the bookcase out. But again, it shows you what I was talking about. Remember how I said that the previous shots, the vertical ones, the layout would literally ended on like a few inches on each side. Most cell phone cameras are actually on one corner. They used to be in the center, which is great because you can rotate your cell phone 180 degrees to either get the camera really low to basically an eye level which is what this would be. Or you could rotate it up to be like an engineer level or maybe say like the brakeman in a, in a train that this one's following or something along those lines. So just, again, you want to play around with it. You want to get an idea of what, what works and what doesn't work. This is the interior of the store that's shown up in a couple of the previous photographs. Clearly has a full interior. I was very happy with it and I was very proud of it. I want to get a photograph of what it looked like from the inside. And I really mold that over. My cell phone will fit in there, but I couldn't zoom in on that for, for squad. It just wouldn't work out. So what I did was I remembered that I had a GoPro camera that does take still photographs. You can actually get an app on your cell phone that actually works with a GoPro, and it'll actually take pictures remotely. GoPros are actually a really small camera. It fits well within the palm of your hand. So I was able to drop the GoPro down inside put the roof back on and turn the lights on on the inside. But you got to remember this camera was never made for this kind of stuff. It's not made for close-up photography. If you notice out the window on the left, it's actually trying to focus on things that are well outside the structure. It's doing a really good job focusing on the car. Now, is this publishable? Will, will Model Railroad or one run this? No, no, not in a million years. But does it show what the interior looks like in a in a perspective of an individual? I mean, of course, the answer is yes. What I also did after that, and what I love doing, is there's plenty of software out there for your cell phone. One of them is a app I like to use. It's called Snapseed. But there's there's oodles of them out there. Don't get don't get caught up on a specific one. There's hundreds of them out there, and they're, most of them are free. Just download them. This particular one, of course, will drop out color, like all of them will do. 
but it, it'll also give you film grain, just like I did that first black and white photograph, the vertical one with all the smoke in it. I did the same thing with that one. I love making photographs because my layout takes place in 1943. So I love taking shots to make it look like somebody pulled out a speed graphic camera in 1943 and took the picture and you found it years later. It didn't look like a heck of a lot in color. I really didn't like it. So I dropped it into black and white, put a little bit of film grain in there, and it just looks like somebody snapped a shot. If they didn't know what they were doing, that's really what this would look like. Don't rule out a specific kind of camera. You can do all kinds of wacky stuff. There's all kinds of digital stuff. There's all kinds of things that are handheld. And I shot this with a cell phone, and this is a good example. Now, cell phones generally want to focus on one tight area. Unless, of course, you're taking pictures of something very big from far away, which you won't have the problem with it. Uh, in this case, I did the exact same thing I did with the previous one. I got the focus on the on the pickup truck, which I keep forgetting what brand it is, but I know it's a 1940 model that I that I'd weathered just a little bit, dropped a uh, uh, ration card in the windshield, and everything's got to be historically accurate on my layout. You got a GI and his Class A's uh, with a Jeep pulling up to him in the background, kind of hard to see, a little out of focus. In color, this wasn't terribly inspiring, but I dropped. All the color out, put a tad bit of sepia tone into it, played around with the exposures a little bit, uh, and then I got this shot. Uh, most layouts, of course, have aisle space in the middle of them, and a lot of people don't like shooting across those because normally what you do is most people will shoot from up high, the, the, the taken from an airplane shot, which is what most layout shots look like, if we're honest with one another. Normally, what you when you take those photographs, you have to avoid the aisle space. Well, how do you really get around that? Well, there's two things you can really do. You can fill the aisle space. And I've actually been playing around with that. I have a large area of uh, static graphs on a mat that one of these days I'm going to fill that aisle in and try some shots with that just to see how that works. I'm shooting across the aisle here at an angle so low you can't see across it. So this scene is actually about six to seven feet deep. You're looking at the back end of the layout. I'm actually standing in the middle of the room. The room is 10 by 11 feet. So I'm going at a 45 degree angle across to the corners. So it's several feet deep. And the depth actually shows up. Now, is it out of focus? Yeah. Is this a publishable picture? Nah, probably not. But is this something kind of cool you can share with people online? Absolutely. I've had a lot of people comment on this. The main thing is, uh, if it doesn't work in color, try it in black and white. You'd be surprised how many meh photographs look pretty good in, 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 when, when you dr uh, drop all the color out of them. I did an article uh, about two years ago for the Narrow Gauge Gazette, and a couple of the shots in there are black and white ones that I'm very, very pleased with and very proud and, and very happy with how they turned out. Two of them that were in black and white that got into the into the magazine were actually really meh color photographs. They didn't look all that great in color. But once I made them black and white, they really popped. Again, don't dismiss a photograph just because it doesn't look exactly the way you wanted to. Play around with it. You'd be surprised what you might be able to get out of it. All right, so this kind of gives you an idea of, uh, again, dropping the, the, the camera into the layouts. You want to consider creative angles to get around things. If I backed up one bit, like if there's an inch on each side of this photograph, you're going to be looking at a wall because that's in the center of the layout. So most people are actually looking at the scene from the opposite side. Very few people, even people run on the layout, rarely ever see it from this angle. They're looking at the back of this depot. Through the depot, through the windows, you're actually seeing a tad bit of the fascia, but my fascia is painted green, so you can't really tell. Like a millimeter to the left is where the edge of the structure is, and you'd be looking at a set of blinds and a window and fascia. So I tightened it up really, really tight. Again, dropped the camera into the layout and got a shot that wouldn't be too unusual to expect an individual just be walking around in real life and just catch the picture, you know, just the figures place what I hopefully uh, hope that they turned out where they look like a realistic interactions. So you got a sailor waiting to get on a ship. You got a or get on a train to get back to a ship. You got a businessman reading a newspaper. You got the uh, you got a brakeman and the station master talking to each other, and then you got the women from the uh, from the rayon mills waiting for the train to show up so they can go for their second shift. But again, don't dismiss where you can place a camera, uh, and just because you realize you're not going to get a great looking background around it, who cares? Okay, this was also a cell phone shot, and I shot that with a uh, with a cell phone I'm using right now. And again, it was the same deal. I mean, it, it didn't look too bad in black and white. But what I did in this particular case, I have a really big window in the room. I didn't want to put like a, a, a background in front of it. 
So every now and then, um, I'll actually open up the window and I'll like, get natural light into the room. Sometimes I'll even shoot out the window. I think I got a photograph in this uh, in this slideshow. But this is natural light late in an afternoon, ambient light coming into the room. I don't think I I don't think I even had the lights turned on in the room. Again, place the cell phone on the ground uh, on the layout inside the layout. And I think I wedged it between two uh, two diecast truck models again. Took a couple of pictures in color. Yeah, it looked all right, but it really popped once I dropped into black and white. Put a little bit of film grain into it, and that excuses the depth of field issues. And but again, if you looked at the original, I probably should put the original photograph in here. You see the massive difference between the two. The first version of this, I would only use that if I if I was talking to one of you in, in person and I want to tell you about the sign I had custom made for uh, for my uh, army railroad unit. So if I wanted to show that sign, that the original photograph would be one I would just pull out my cell phone and like, this is what the sign looks like. That, that'd be the only reason why I would have. Instead, I turned this into something that's actually, I think, worked out pretty well. But again, don't don't dismiss color. Um, you know, picture doesn't current turn out. Drop it in black and white, play around with the exposures, the contrasts, uh, highlights, shadow, things like that. Uh, might not work, but it's certainly worth a try. Exact same deal. Ambient light. You can actually see the glow off the window. The window is like about right off of the left of the photograph, which is kind of clear. You can see, you know, you could say this is probably like a smoky afternoon or something like that. But I just got the focus just exactly the way I wanted to. I've looked at lots and lots of uh, photographs from the 30s and 40s, and, and depth of field like this is actually pretty common in those speed graphics. And some of the less expensive cameras, the depth of field was really crummy. I mean, you really had to be exactly where you wanted it or standing at a great distance with a good good lens. And that's the that's what I've been shooting for here, so to speak. I didn't drop any film grain into it, which you can kind of see that in the station sign, uh, the, the name of the, the, the depot above the top of the Jeep. Uh, you can kind of see it how it look, out of focus. If I put some film grain in there, it would really look look more correct. But again, dropping the dropping the camera into the scene, you'd, you'd be surprised what you what you can get. Uh, exact same thing. Uh, I took this with a cell phone, the exact same deal. I laid it on the on the ground, wedged it behind another diecast vehicle. Tried to get this shot. I wanted it low to the ground. This is an angle you really can't see very well on the layout in real life. Um, this house is a little far back from the fascia. The fascia is kind of in a wedge shape, so you don't really, you can't really get that close to it. You're normally, most people are looking at it from about three to five feet away at least. So I wanted to get a really good look because I'm really happy with how this structure turned out and I like the look of it. It's actually more of a flat. If you see this, <laughs> this, Structure from the side, it's actually really, really shallow. It's not a flat. It's a. I, I, I tried to place the figures to get an idea of what was going on. I got, I got a mother calming down, uh, probably a crying baby. I got another woman on the on the doorstep uh, with a broom. Character I call Mrs. Enzer. She's she's the she owns the farm and she's not to be trifled with. And she's uh, getting ready to clean some uh, rugs hanging off of the uh, clothesline to the right. But I just tried to create that scene. I didn't photograph. I want to show what it was reason for. Like, in other words, if somebody's taking a picture back then, what would they be taking a picture of? Back in the day, most people staged photograph. They would pose people for this kind of thing. But I'm thinking like maybe a news guy from the 40s walking around and wanted to kill some film. But again, it just gives you an idea of what you can get if you play around. Now, this was with a filter puts this kind of halo effect around it, like a not quite well processed and it works pretty well. And a lot of these softwares, uh, software applications, the apps that you can get, a lot of them have these kind of things. They're, they're already preset into them because this is a pretty common and popular thing to do with photography, but like recreating 30s and 40s kind of pictures. So, all right. So this is a just a normal shot. Uh, again, I dropped this. Uh, I put the camera down. Uh, believe it or not, the shadow is not from the camera. It's actually from a tree that's adjacent to where the camera is. I placed the camera down on the surface of the layout, figured out exactly where I wanted everything, placed a couple of vehicles. I got a car coming in, uh, waiting at the grade crossing. The cone of smoke is just above the, the stack, but I put just a tiny little bit. It's about a minute and a half exposure. I think I put it in there for about 20 or 30 seconds. Because again, I wanted to show like 
good firing on a locomotive because in real life you don't see much smoke if they do a good job. But this gives you an idea of what the scene on the left looked like because a photograph a couple of shots ago, that's the same, the exact same thing. So it kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like in real life versus what the with the photograph I got. And if you can just play around with the lighting and the contrast, it's amazing what you can get. But this is more of a, just a basic shot. I, I try for things a little slice of life. Uh, you're actually there. That's, that's what I shoot for. This is not dropped in the layout. This was actually done from a tripod in the aisle. Uh, the fascia, the layout, the edge of the layout is probably about two inches from the bottom of the photograph. It shows you how you can play around with some lighting effects that are cheap, easy, uh, effective, and timeless. Lighting on inside the structure to the right, a scratch build, building I got, got an LED inside that. Unfortunately, with a long exposure, interior lighting, you just get what you see there. It's just bright. You can't see that there's a full interior in there. With these long exposures, that's the one disadvantage. But I wanted to point out a really uh, easy and cheap effect here, the, the headlight. Now, the headlight was actually done with a clear drinking straw. And clear ones are kind of hard to get. They're usually white or they got stripes on them. But if you can find a clear one, I found one which is exactly the diameter of the headlight on my Baldwin trench engine. So I actually held the straw up against the lit headlight and it lit the straw all the way down its long axis. Now, the further away from the headlight, the, the more of it, like a straw it looks like. So you don't wanna go very far with this. That was probably at least a minute exposure as well. And I held that straw there the entire time. I just held it there by hand. You can be careful with that because uh, a couple of shots actually pushed the locomotive by accident and had to retake the picture. But of course, I dropped the color out, put a little sepi into it. I uh, did the same thing um, with a 10-wheeler. Now you know what I did. It's real obvious that it's a plastic drinking straw. But uh, I've shown this photograph to people and asked them how, how they thought I did it. And nobody guessed that that's what I had done with it. The straw actually goes into another uh, lit area, so it kind of breaks it up. So it, it kind of has that look, that uh, a beam of, of, of light that you can't create with any kind of model train light that I've ever seen. I've never seen a model train headlight anywhere that actually creates a beam of light like that. This gives you the look, the look that we know that exists in real life. And long exposure, uh, because of the interior of the, of the depot that's directly in front of you, uh, you can't see anything on the inside. That's the one disadvantage of these long exposures. Nothing you can do about that. These old techniques that they tried, you'd be surprised. You pull out old issues of model railroader from going back to the 50s. Some of them will tell you all these really neat kind of uh, tricks that they use. And that's where I got the idea for this. I think it was an old uh, model railroader, some ancient article from the 60s or something, like 50s or 60s. And I just happened to stumble across it and the guy was talking about that's what he did. And I was like, hmm, let me see what I can do. An hour later, I had this photograph. I was actually shooting these pictures for um, O-Gage trains, but I realized I was taking these really long exposures and I thought, hey, what if I had the train sitting here for 20 to 30 seconds of a, of a two minute exposure and then immediately ran it out as fast as humanly possible where you can't see the motion of it. So you wind up with a ghost train. You're actually looking through you can do all kinds of things with this. You can actually do all kinds of effects. I'm, I'm uh, messing around with the idea of actually doing fog effects. Like I have this idea that I just haven't gotten around to having pieces of cardboard cut in like smoke profiles, just a white piece of poster board, multiple sheets of it at multiple distances, place it in a scene, wiggle it around for a few seconds, move it a few inches back, wiggle it again and then and, and then keep repeating. I'm thinking I might be able to get a fog effect out of that. But this was kind of the first uh, first experiment I was trying to mess around with to get the idea. You could yes. use that ghost image to be somebody's memory of the trains that used to run here when the station is old, but it's being used by diesel trains. But somebody's memory is that old steamer. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. You could you could do all kinds of things with that for that. But yeah, you're right. You can do all kinds of ghost trains. You can do all kinds of wacky stuff with it. You could even have like a, a a conventional modern train sitting there, pose your figures where they're looking like aghast at something, and then have like you do like a ghost train or something right there. And when the picture comes out, it looks like they're they're interacting with it. They're looking at it like holy mackerel, what the heck is that? 
this is a night nice shot. We got plenty. We all have have tried the, this picture. The one thing that's different about it is um, this is a relatively long exposure. The one thing you want to do with headlights is if you're doing a really long exposure, the headlight can really overpower the scene. In some cases, what I'll do is I'll actually turn the headlight on, start the exposure, and then immediately turn the headlight off to where you got just enough of the brightness that the camera thinks that the headlight's actually on. In this case, it was I left it on because you can see by the star pattern, that's what's left over from a from a fixed light that stays on through a long exposure. But the one trick I wanted to show with you guys is the uh, notice the blue tint to it. Now, moonlit nights don't really look blue. It's one of those things that, that Hollywood likes to give the look and, and people like to do it in art. But moonlit nights actually are kind of a really light grayish color more than anything else. I spent a lot of time outdoors in my life and I know what it, what it looks like in a moonlit night. How I did this was where did the blue light come from? It's real simple. I'm shooting this with a camera on a tripod. I uploaded a photograph of the color blue, like a really light blue color, a really, really light royal blue color, almost a sky blue color. And I had it on my phone and I, I blew it up on my screen to my screen was this really light blue color. And all I did was I just, I just waved it over the top of the scene several times. The camera is still picking up the colors of everything. So a blue filter would make it all look blue. But this regular shot shows the colors that it's seeing in real life with a bluish tint. So the headlight looks exactly as it should. The grass that is illuminated in the foreground by the headlight looks green like it should as well. So you're not using just a filter. Now, maybe you can recreate this with some kind of app filter or something like that. If you can, I'm not aware of it. I like doing these shots in real time. Shutter is, is done and I look at the screen. I'm looking at essentially what, I'm, what I wanted. All, the vast majority of these shots, all they've done is crop them, and in some cases, drop the color out. Uh, again, I'm not using Photoshop on, on these things. Waving something blue over top of this thing in this night shot, I, I think I got a halfway decent picture. Now, again, is this publishable? Eh, no, not really, because the headlight kind of screwed things up. But it gives you an idea of what you can, what can, what you can do if you're trying for a night shot. All right, so this is an older shot. This gives you an idea of what I was talking about earlier about doing effects in real time. Again, I'm using the smoke cone uh, to show the uh, locomotives being fired correctly. So it's just a tiny little bit of smoke coming off of it. Some people might not even notice it because the trees are in the background. So how do I do the steam effects if I'm not using Photoshop? Because there's a photographer figure in the foreground. So how did I do that if I didn't use Photoshop? Well, again, this is a really long exposure. What I did was I took two paper towels, twisted them in, in kind of semi-cone shapes. So I brought my long-suffering wife uh, into the layout room and asked her to take one and stab the cylinders on the engineer's side while I stabbed the cylinders on the fireman's side as well as, as uh, jiggled the, the smoke cone over the top of the stack for about 30, 10 to 15 seconds. And we did the, uh, the, the, the paper towels a little bit longer because the steam, of course, normally uh, uh, pretty clear you know, in those shots. So it looks out of focus. Uh, it's got the look of steam. It's actually behind certain things, but in front of others. So like, for example, you can see that what's going on at the, at the store in the background through the steam. And in real life, the steam would be a lot more opaque than that, but it gives you an idea. But this is a really, really old school method. Um, this is the kind of thing that people did with old cameras back in the 30s and 40s, but it worked. I even got into Model Railroader with a photograph. Uh, very, very, I've actually recreated this picture numerous times because I just love how it turned out. I actually got in a Model Railroader with a photograph taken from a very similar angle using the exact same techniques. All right, so this is a shot taken uh, as most people would uh, looking slightly down on the layout, your classic layout shot that most people take, myself included. And what I did was I just used the smoke cone. Uh, the angle of the lighting made it look kind of odd. Uh, I wouldn't submit this for, for, um, for any kind of magazine, but I also put uh, the, the same paper towel, I put it down on the whistle to try to get a whistle effect as well. 
I would probably play around with this quite a bit before uh, I would consider that the finished version. But it gives you an idea because you can do uh, if you can do one of those things in, in a shot. If a, if it's a really long exposure, like this would have been about at least 90 seconds. So the smoke cone's probably 10, 15 seconds. The whistle, the paper towel is probably about the same amount of time. So I'm actually doing both one stopping and then doing the other. But the one advantage to this stuff is, unlike doing Photoshop, it, uh, if you Photoshop smoke into a locomotive, it doesn't cast shadows. And I should have probably pointed that out in the previous photographs. This creates shadows. It generates shadows from like the smoke and everything like that. So the cover of, uh, of O-Scale Trains, the cover that I got, there's actually a, a, a clear shadow of the locomotive and the smoke coming off of it. Nobody who does like Photoshop, dropping real smoke from a real photograph in, a, in the Photoshop, you never see the, the shadow because number one, it's really tough to do it. You can, but you really got to mess around with the photograph to do that. And I, I, I wouldn't try it. You basically have to use like two or three photographs and layer them that way. This effect actually will create shadows on the ground. And if you do what I do, I always like to have light coming from a single source. So if you do that, it'll create a really nice shadow like it would in real life. That's just something a lot of people don't think of. All right, so here's another shot. Again, uh, very similar to the, uh, the sample I showed you. Just drop the camera. This wasn't on, on the tracks, but it's definitely in, uh, on the layout. There's a tree to the left. There's a foot of layout to the left. And the edge of the, 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 the wall is actually to the right. But I got a whole bunch of trees. I brought it in at an oblique angle, so you're looking down the long axis of a whole bunch of trees here. So you can't really, or easily, that is, see the edge of the layout that way. The uh, background, way in the back, it looks like a hill. That's actually a piece of uh, MDF board, which was cut in a profile of a hill covered in ground foam. That's actually a permanent backdrop on the layout. But when this angle, you can't really tell that. It actually looks like a faraway hill. Again, playing with angles, uh, trying to hide things that are not quite as obvious that way makes the, makes the layout look a heck of a lot bigger than it actually is. This scene is about four feet deep, I would think, and you got the shadow of the tree. Now, some people might think that I screwed up and there's some uh, lunchbox or something, you know, whatever, a camera bag or something actually cast in shadow. The tree's actually cast in shadow. And to the far left of the photograph, you can see the edge of the tree. A lot of people wouldn't think to shoot any kind of photograph on a layout that actually has high shadows like this. I love them because in real life, that's what, that's what this looks like. Now, the one thing I do when I'm taking these photographs, these really long exposures, I drop the lighting down. Uh, I have a, a lighting system. Uh, it's a set of LED cans on a track and I have individual cans pointed at individual scenes. With a remote, I can actually drop the lighting down. I can actually dull it down. I can actually, uh, like a dimmer switch, pretty much. And um, so I drop the lighting down quite a bit. Although it looks awful bright in here, in the room, it's pretty, I'm not going to say dark, but it's not exactly bright, sunshiny, bright in there when I'm taking these shots. But again, long exposures, you know, they suck up the light. Gives you an idea um, to getting into a scene uh, and then as well as hiding the things that you really don't want the viewer to see anyway. Okay, again, I mentioned that this is an angle I really like shooting. I just absolutely flip and love this angle. Um, smoke cones in the picture, but you can't really see it. I have the, the, the train actually being fired correctly. And again, I'm looking across the fascia, the edge of the layout is actually the extreme far right, about the center of the photograph. There's a mailbox on the far right right at the far right edge of the screen in the, in, along the center. Yeah, just to the right of that is the actual edge of the layout. You can see the very edge of the fascia, but if you don't know that that's what it is, you don't see it. So what I wanted was I want to get the mailbox, the telephone poles, the sign for the store and everything. I want to get everything in, and then the locomotive come around a curve. The, the, again, the camera's dropped into the layout. It's actually sitting on the end of a spur. But again, it gives you an idea. The depth of field worked out pretty well. Normally you're going to kill something in your depth of field when you're doing this. In the foreground, it's not quite so in focus, but the background actually worked pretty well. Okay, and just a, another another shot, just dropped it in. Now this one, you can really see the backdrops. It didn't really work out all that well, but I just I just love the angle anyway. 
uh, is this uh, a shot to submit to a magazine? Eh, probably not. I don't really like looking down the, the backdrop on its long axis like this. I just I just like how it looks. That's the criteria of any of any shot. You know, how does it look to you? Is this what you're looking for? There's another one right here. Now, I didn't use a smoke cone at all. And what I did was because the guy, he could be drifting down grade. I don't really have any grades on the layout, but you can't tell in the photograph. So the one thing I, you rarely ever see is trains crossing or, or steam locomotives crossing grade crossing while they're blowing the whistle. It's just not something people do. They, they'll, they'll drop a smoke in like Photoshop, but they never think to put the whistle in. So I use the paper towel trick. Uh, not perfect, but it, you know, it gives you an idea. It just, it's kind of a slice of life shot. But uh, those little details like that, the more you know about trains, the, the, the more you think about that. All right, now remember I said that I have a window. The light is just right and the time of day is just right. I can open up the blinds and actually get a legit, no kidding, actual backdrop of nature. So that backdrop is probably about a quarter of a mile away, <laughs> as opposed to a few inches away. I lit the foreground. I tried to match the lighting from the outside, and I took the shot. Now, um, the center divider for the window is about an inch to the right. The blinds in the edge of the window are about an inch to the left. I have a very narrow area I can shoot from, so it doesn't leave much. So I rolled up the the back end of coach with a conductor figure as well as the cab, the locomotive, and, and just got my shot that way. Never rule out any kind of uh, a scene on your layout. This one, for example, uh, like the previous one I mentioned, you're looking across about three quarters of the layout. That This scene all the way from the foreground to the background is about at least five or six feet. And there's an aisle in the, in the middle of it, but you just can't see it from the angle I'm shooting. Play with angles. Uh, you don't have to have expensive equipment. You don't have to have expensive cameras. You just need to have an eye for what you're trying to do. Uh, if there are any questions, if people are, if anyone's still awake, I'd be uh, happy to entertain them. I have a question. What is the typical f-stop that you start with to get your long exposures? See, I knew you'd ask me that. That's that's yeah. why I didn't want to go. In, that's why I go, didn't want to go into the technical issues. Uh, actually, what I do is I have preset settings on my i use shoot with a canon slr it, it, it's set on basically auto i i set it for as long of exposure as possible it presets itself for whatever f-stop that it decides it wants to do i get different uh versions of of of, of f-stop through there i i really i'd have to pull my camera out it's been so long since i've had to reset it i really wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head so i i, I do apologize for that well that's a, that's okay in other words you set the time the camera sets the f-stop Yes. Yeah. Okay. Some cameras do, some don't. That's the reason why I didn't want to get too deep in the right. technical stuff because you're, you know, the old saying, your mileage may vary, your camera may vary. Right. Right. So right. each camera is going to be different, especially if you're shooting like with a more manual one. Um, the the camera that I use is, uh, well, it's about six years old now. Really, what you want to do is you, uh, a lot of cameras have settings for really long exposures. It's called different things on different cameras. So you really want to set it for really long exposure. You want to already set the aperture of the lens as small as possible to make up for the fact that it knows that you're taking a really long, really long exposure. Now, if you're shooting a manual camera, like a, say like a like the Pentax K1500 that I have, uh, like an old old school film camera, um, you'd manually crank down your f-stop. You want to you basically you'd want to make the aperture as small as humanly possible. And while letting in as much light as possible. So that's in effect is what a pinhole lens actually is. You're shooting a really small uh, a, a small aperture with as much light stuff through it as possible. Remedy is a great deal of uh, depth of field issues. But yeah, the, the technical aspects of that, I, that I that I really, really don't want to get into because it changes so much from camera to camera and situation to situation. Because for example, your layout may be lit totally different than mine is. So if I told you that your f-stop should be this, it probably won't work on your layout. You see what I mean? So. Right. right. Um, so I'm planning on making a, it's a small six and a half by two foot uh, prototypical switching layout. I was wondering if any of these, any of these suggestions kind of change because of that or, whether whether the fundamental ideas stay the same. 
Oh, they're gonna be the same no matter what, no matter how big the layout is. There's probably only like one or two of you here listening to this who actually seen the layout. My layout is tiny. It's a 10 by 11 foot room. So it's really, really small. So I'm really shooting areas like what you're talking about. What you're talking about though, if you if you can possibly get it outside, that's a neat thing you can do with that. Because that way you don't have to worry about your background. So you get nature as a background. Uh, I have no idea how uh, mobile it would be. Um, but what I would suggest uh, in a case like that is you'd want to have some kind of fixed background uh, to when you're shooting on it. Because if it's really long, if you're shooting down its long axis, you're going to want to, you're going to have to hide the left and the right. Because if you notice the angles that I was shooting, I was shooting at an angle. Because eventually, you know, the, the perspective, um, if you're shooting, if you have like really long uh, uh, module style layout like you're talking about, eventually you're going to run out of layout. So if you shoot down its long axis, eventually, you know, it's just going to narrow, 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 then all of a sudden you're looking at the sides of it. So you're probably going to want to get your, your angles relatively tight. You're going to want to focus on just a very tight scene, a couple of elements in the background if possible. It's probably what you're going to be able to get. You don't dismiss any angle. Play with it. Just take oodles of photographs from every conceivable angle. You'd be surprised. You'll, you will surprise yourself. You'll You'll get shots and say, wow, I didn't think I could get a shot from this angle because about half the pictures in this in this slideshow were shots that I got by accident that I that I was like, now well, let's just see what this looks like. Click. Wow, this is great, man. I never even thought I'd shoot. And, and my layout is uh, been scenic for about five years, give or take. And I'm still finding new angles, even a tiny little layout like this. I'm still finding new angles to shoot with. But that would be my best uh, suggestion is just play with it. Just net, just don't give up looking for new new places to shoot at. Wait, also, are you in the Puget Sound or are you from somewhere further out? No, I'm in, uh, I live in Rochester. Uh, the, the, the railroad I model takes place in Tennessee in the 1940s. But uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm definitely in the Puget Sound. So uh, a, a few of these, few of these folks know who I am. Yeah, I'd love to come down to your lab sometime. <laughs> Well, it is going to be open for the National uh, uh, Narrow Gauge Convention, and once we start actually have open houses and, and events like that, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be more inclined to um, to open that up. I guess that's it. I guess so. Well, thank you, Lee. My goodness, the, some of those pictures are absolutely gorgeous and um, very impressive. I'm inspired to take pictures. Now, I didn't first need to build a layout, but then take some pictures. <laughs> Yeah, you do have to have that. So yeah, I have to have a layout. Yes. Lee, thank you. This is outstanding, and I look forward to seeing your presentation in uh, September. Uh, you're an ON30 uh, model builder, and uh, the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina is a, a railroad that a lot of us are interested in seeing more of uh, back there in Tennessee. Well, I was interested because I'm trying to figure out what to do with my old cameras. Seeing as how, you know, golly, I got two or three of them in the closet here. I don't know what to do with them. I guess I should pull them out and start using them again. Well, that's, you know, I mean, think about it like the, you know, the uh, John Allen or even like uh, Lucius Beeb or some of these, you know, the, 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 the famous people in real and model train photography. I mean, for every picture you saw that they that turned out, there's a hundred that didn't. Trust me, all the pictures I got don't look like that. I mean, you know, for, for every one of those pictures you saw, there's probably about at least 20 ones where it just hit dully, you know, because it is what it is. But so it's a hundred to one ratio, right? You get one good one out of a hundred shots. I'm not that bad at it, but uh, <laughs> but I, in, in, in my case, I probably get when I when I sit down and actually shoot pictures in terms of like stuff I would be usable in a magazine, I probably get like one per session. So if I spend like an hour shooting pictures or something like that, it depends on how many I shoot. It could be 20, 30 or something like that. I, I might get one usable one. In those cases, the ones that you saw, each one of those was one that that was the only one out of all the ones that I took that turned out. But no, not 101, but I'd say 20 to 30 to one easily. Oh, yeah. Would you be willing to submit a couple of your photos to the NMRA calendar so we can see it on our wall? <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually done trying that. Uh, I, I did that for three years in a row and, and nothing ever came of it. And, and I, I've actually submitted a lot of really, really good pictures 
that never went anywhere. So I'm I'm not wasting the pixels anymore on that. But, well, last um, year they were begging for photos. Well, they were begging too hard because um, um, I got this past one and the one before it. I am mentioned in the back cover in each of them as one of the ones that submitted, but. This past one, though, the one that just came out, the 2022, I'm actually pretty impressed with the pictures in, the, in that one. I really did like those. I, when, I, when I looked at that calendar, I said, okay, now I understand why I didn't make the cut on this one. I, I was okay with that. The year before, I had, I had lots of people actually writing me going, I wouldn't have believed you actually submitted at all if, if, this, if it didn't make the cut, if it wasn't for the fact your name's in, not in the back of them. But my understanding is they normally use the photographs from the convention anyway. So if they're going to have a legit convention this year, um, I've tried it three years. And I'm, at, at this point, I'm, I'm doing pretty well with the magazines. I think I've hit every 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 magazine in a hobby that, that I can. Obviously, like, like N-scale magazines or something like that, you know. But I mean, if, if, if O-scale will work in it, I've been in them. Like, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going sour grapes or something. Like that. The NMRA calendar is really nice. And I really like the 2022 one. I was I was very okay with not making a cut there. If no one has anything else to talk about. Um, our next clinic should be Thursday, February third. Um, if anyone is interested in presenting a clinic, feel free to reach out to me. Um, also, if you're down in Tacoma head on over to the 40 ho layout i'll be probably down there both days playing trades um and uh it was good to see you all and uh actually being here so um cool it was nice to see some people from far away in alaska which is nice it's always good <laughs> All right, and again, thanks so much, Lee. That was a great, great uh, clinic. And so everybody have a pleasant night, stay warm, and hopefully we won't get any more snow. So. Thank you. All righty, bye guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, good night, everybody. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Lee, great presentation. Right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good job.